Pierre Beaumont's life changed radically on October 12, 1945. That was the date that the young designer chose to schedule his house's first presentation to the public. Held inside the salon of his new headquarters at 44 Rue de Francois Pimier, in the center of Paris's famed Golden Triangle luxury neighborhood. 25 years later, in 1970, during an interview with the French press, Pierre Beaumont discussed his house's first collection and the show. He told them that he could sum up the first collection in just one word. It was, he said, a miracle. And you know, that actually is the perfect summation. It's true, that first Beaumont show really was miraculous. As they prepared for that collection and that very first show, the young designer and his new Beaumont team were faced with some pretty overwhelming challenges, some of which we can barely even comprehend today. And those challenges seemed to be constant. He had to figure out ways to face difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. You know, given the time in which he was living and the challenges that he had to face in order to set up his house, design and create his collection, and somehow get it out there in front of everyone, to call it a miracle is very far from an exaggeration. Pierre Mom fought every single day to make his dream happen, literally risking everything. During an incredibly difficult time, he took an enormous risk, but somehow he seems to have remained convinced at every single step along the way that his audacious risk was worth it. And you know what? Not only did he do what he had to do, in the end, he pulled it off better than anyone could have ever imagined. Of course, a story like that one, of determination, a tough environment, incredible odds, and then an inspiring final beautiful victory? Well, in a lot of ways, I guess, it seems a little more appropriate as a storyline for one of those very cliched, very unbelievable Hollywood movies, as opposed to an actual, real-life fashion collection. For all of us today, now that we're all so, well, I guess, jaded, so cynical, well, we, we automatically doubt that it ever could have really happened that way. But... The truth is, it did. It really did happen that way. As one goes through the Balmain archives and the press clippings of the era, it's really hard not to be incredibly impressed by Pierre Balmain's daring, his determination, and accomplishments. Plus, and I guess probably most importantly, it's now obvious to all of us that his work, his worries, and his great effort were clearly worth it. For that first presentation, Pierre Beaumont created a strikingly beautiful collection, and he used that collection to begin to build the incredible and strong foundation that this house still relies on today. Hello, I'm John Gilligan. Today for our third L'Atelier Beaumont podcast... We will be concentrating on the first time that Pierre Beaumont presented a Beaumont collection to the public. That presentation, which took place three quarters of a century ago, may have been a short one. But the challenges, creations, and personalities connected to the very first Beaumont moment are really, frankly, fascinating. For this podcast, we will be exploring together a few of the great stories connected to that first Beaumont show. I am Olivier Roustin. Welcome to my world. Welcome to my world. Bienvenue à l'atelier Balmain. Bienvenue à l'atelier Balmain. So, as we discussed in our first episode, Pierre Balmain was only 30 years old when Paris was liberated and he decided to found his own couture house. Balmain grabbed the recently vacated space on 44 Rue de Francois Premier and decided to start his own house almost on an impulse. His memoirs, though, make clear that he felt he simply could not wait any longer to make a change. And the truth is, he definitely wasn't the only Parisian looking for new beginnings at that time. All around him, there were beginnings of brave new green shoots of a cultural rebirth. France was entering into what some would later call the Agne Zero, or Year Zero, the moment after so much had been destroyed and so much seemed ready to start anew. Among those who would fill the cultural void was a new generation of Parisian talents who were just beginning to dare to introduce distinctive, startling, and unexpected ways of seeing, thinking, and creating in almost every artistic and creative field. And today we know all of their names. UNESCO, Camus, Beckett, Genet, Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, 
Prévert, Greco, Godard, Truffaut, those great and talented young post-war artists who, after so many years of burned books, strict curfews, and totalitarian control, were more than ready to take full advantage of new liberties, new freedoms, and new possibilities. They were inspired to put forward startling new vision in music, literature, theater, and cinema, creating an explosion of creativity that began in Paris immediately after the war and continued for decades afterwards. C'est une fleur de Paris, du vieux Paris qui sourit, car c'est la fleur du retour, du retour des beaux jours. Right around that time, there was a hit song called Fleur de Paris, the Parisian flower. It was written right after Paris's liberation and reflects the new optimism of that moment. The famous crooner Maurice Chevalier made the song a hit, and its message of hope and new beginnings was very clear. Chevalier sang about a blue, white, and red flower that Parisians had kept in themselves for four long years, locked up and hidden away, in hopes that someday better days would return. Finally, lyrics proclaimed, those better days were returning, and it was time to celebrate a new dawn, new hopes, and a new blooming for the beautiful Fleur de Paris. Pendant quatre ans, dans nos cœurs, elle a gardé ses couleurs, bleu, blanc, rouge, avec l'espoir, elle a fleuri, fleur de Paris. And while Paris might have been hungry for new changes, for new ideas, and for a better future, we need to remember that Paris was also, quite literally, just plain hungry. Of course, the war had taken an enormous toll on France. After so much repression, death, and destruction, returning to normal life was not going to be easy. Just finding food was a daily struggle for many. Throughout the long occupation, raw materials had been diverted to the German war effort. Everyone had been issued a specific type of ration card based on age and family size. Waiting in line for hours just for the most basic of necessities had turned into a daily obligation. And after the war, things actually became worse. During the many bombing runs, battles, invasions, and retreats, the country's production facilities and transport networks had been destroyed, making producing and getting any goods to market a logistical impossibility. So it was a very tough time for many Parisians. There was no coal for heating, and winters right after the liberation were unusually cold. One-sixth of Parisian buildings were estimated to be in a state of disrepair, and there was no cement, no mortar, no brick to rebuild the many damaged structures. Just think about this. 80% of French window frames were estimated to be filled with cardboard or wood squares because there was not simply no access to glass for such a long period of time. The shortages meant that food rations had to continue after the war. But even if Parisians could find enough food to use their coupons on, they were only guaranteed 1,400 calories a day, which is just barely above the 1,200 minimum calories that we need to just survive. So there was no coffee, there was no tea, and most Frenchmen found themselves limited to just three quarters of a baguette each day, one half pound of meat each week, and one egg each month. Overall, during the war and the liberation, the average Parisian is estimated to have lost between four to eight kilos, which is nine to 17 pounds. Visiting soldiers, whether they were German or American, always seemed to remark on how slender Parisian women were. The truth is, much of that was due to forced exercise, as biking and walking replaced cars and buses, as well as several years of just not eating enough food. So living here in Paris now, it's hard to imagine what those days must have been like for so many Parisians. The facts, the figures, and the stories seem like something out of a fairy tale. It is so hard to get your head around the fact that here, in this beautiful and prosperous city, just 75 years ago, so many people were suffering, so many people didn't have nearly enough to eat. There were hundreds of normal needs that just went unsatisfied here, because so many basic items were basically impossible to find. Think about it. There was no soap, no milk, no paper, no toothbrushes, no needles and threads, no knives and forks, no pans and pots, and the list goes on and on and on. But as several Parisians of the time wrote, the worst was to have a life with so much cold and so much darkness. 
since there was no coal and no gas for heat or electricity. And of course, to be hungry for so long. With the shortages and the rationing, limited and changed each and every one of the typical Parisians' daily choices. And yes, even everyday fashion choices of Parisians were affected. Lynn Yeager, the prize-winning American fashion journalist, is perhaps best known for her many American Vogue articles. And she always has such an enjoyable take on the intersection of fashion, politics, and society. Lynn agreed to come talk with me today a little bit about fashion and challenges of that time in Paris. Hey, Lynn, good morning. Thanks very much for calling in from New York to join the podcast. Really, really happy you can do this. And we're happy you were able to give us some help, that we, the kind of help that we need as we try to understand more about wartime styles, fashion, and Balmain in 1945. So I've been thinking that maybe the best way to start this off is to try to set the stage. It'd be great if you could help us try to put everything into context. Maybe you could start off by helping us understand what Parisian fashion was like during the war. What was it that made it so distinctive? What was the spirit and the style of the time? Well, basically, I would say that the French were coming at it from a very different angle than what we think about when we think about wartime dressing in the 40s in the UK and in America. Of course, the war affected everybody around the world and the shortages as well. But the French were facing a very different reality in their everyday life. Obviously, many French had entirely different feelings about the need to sacrifice and support the troops dramatically opposite approaches to the whole issue of wartime clothing restrictions. In the USA and the UK, military looks were adapted to reflect a patriotic spirit. And there was also, I think, in those countries, uh, a kind of uh, wanting not to look too dressed up or too fancy. It was kind of in the spirit of all hands on deck for, put, you know, for the material uh, necessities of the war. But in France, where style and fashion is so much a part of the culture, and so much a part of the ethos of Paris, uh, the idea of dressing up and looking fabulous could be seen almost as a sign of resistance. Um, and because France was occupied, there was also really the idea of dressing up was really much more uh, an act of rebellion. Many Parisians flouted regulations at every opportunity. They avoided drab wartime styles and stubbornly clung to the fashionable looks that made Paris Paris as a way of thumbing their noses at the Germans. The attitude seemed to be, we'll show the Germans. You can take away everything for your war effort, but you can't take away our innate spirit and creativity. Of course, there were severe shortages, which made this kind of difficult. Basically, from the three months after the occupation began, France was stripped bare. Workers was stripped conscripted, sorry, to German factories, all goods and materials delegated to German war efforts. There was very little heat, hardly any reliable electricity, uh, food was becoming more and more scarce. So you wouldn't think people would really care that much about how they looked, but the Parisians did. So Lynn, how did that very distinctive Parisian mindset in those severe wartime shortages manifest themselves in the era's fashion choices? I mean, Say we're suddenly transported back in time, and we found ourselves on the avenues of the French capital during the occupation. Exactly what kind of everyday fashion world would we expect to see there? So we're thinking short dresses, we're thinking platform shoes, and a lot of times those platforms are made out of cork or cardboard or things that are not really what you think of when you think of shoe design. The big shoulder pads, the bright colors, and the heavy makeup. Overall, there was an avoidance of the colors and military styles that would reference troops or Nazi soldiers, especially green khaki army colors and any mixing of the red, black, and white colors of the Nazi flag. Of course, most Parisians were just scrapping by suffering the most severe hardships. They were patching and repairing clothing, and they were putting together whatever they could with whatever they found. But of course, French women, as we know, being French, could manage to look pretty fabulous in their own incredible way, despite the most horrific circumstances. So, Lynn, a week or so ago, when we first started talking about this topic together on the phone, you shared some really fascinating insights on the role that hats and turbans played in the Parisian fashion of the time. Would you mind sharing those thoughts about those unique fashion choices? It became very popular at the beginning of the occupation since they could be fashioned and decorated from non-rationed material adding a bit of style when clothing choices were more limited. French women working with scraps, wood shavings, 
anything you could find created the most fanciful hats imaginable. I even read an account of people putting like vegetables on their heads just because you could, because you could get a vegetable and then you could eat it. But little by little, women started replacing their hats with turbans since, as Le Monde noted, shampoo had disappeared and the harsh soap took its toll on hair and salons were unaffordable luxury for most people. The soap, everyone agrees, was horrible. It made your skin peel. You couldn't wash your hair. There was simply no shampoo. Those who did manage to wash their hair couldn't dry it easily, much less curl it. There was no electricity for drying hair, and hair salons were really non-existent. So women adopted turban to hide unwashed, unsouthed hair and create a popular new alternative to hats as well. Okay, so Lynn, what about the other elements of Parisians' daily fashion choices? Like, for example, what kind of shoes were Parisians wearing during the war? The shoes were quite a challenge. Without leather for shoes, the French resorted to wooden cork, thus creating the style for platform shoes. Wooden soles became the norm. Basically, you had a choice. You could be miserable in them or turn them into fashion and have the highest possible platform. Also, with the lack of cars, no gas, the new sound of Paris boulevards was now the clack clack of hundreds wearing wooden heels on the sidewalk, giving the city a whole new loud and distinctive urban symphony. So how did the occupiers react to these bold fashion choices? What did the Nazis think about Parisian fashion during the war? Well, clearly they don't seem to have been very happy. The Nazis were especially bothered by the carefree attitude behind the wild hats, so much so that they threatened to close up the millinery shops. The occupiers pushed unsuccessful campaign to convince French women to adopt a more support the troops look, a more patriotic look, one that they believed was preferable to the arrogant, bold styles that dominated wartime Paris. And so what happened after the Nazis left and the occupation was all over? I mean, once Paris was liberated and the French were finally able to live free in exactly how they wanted, did the mindset, styles, and fashion choices change? Well, of course, things actually did not improve immediately. The invasions, battles, and massive bombings had destroyed delivery systems and logistics, making supplies even harder to ship. And of course, the war was still going on, even after Paris was liberated. Germany was not defeated until May 1945, and the Allies still had to continue the war in Asia. So goods were still being pushed to the war effort. Things were tough, even without the repression and danger of the Nazis. There's a quote from the Figaro newspaper from December 1944. It's been four years since Frenchmen have been able to buy new underwear, it stated. You get the feeling that the people were getting desperate, almost like they soon might be forced to just go naked. There was nowhere near enough leather or fabric available, and after five years of war, most closets were filled with clothing that was pretty threadbare. Savvy sewers were lucky enough to have access to threaded needles, and they began to turn tablecloths, draperies, and rugs into clothing. So with all these horrible shortages that Parisians were facing every single day, what was the situation in the city's famous luxury boutiques? I mean, we all know that Paris is super famous for all its shopping, right? So were all the boutiques just forced to close due to a lack of anything to sell? Well, I'm sure that many stores were forced to close. For example, there doesn't seem to have been a lot of the familiar chocolate and pastry shops of Paris that were open for business, which would make sense because the food supplies were so limited. What's interesting to see is how a whole new crop of American and British correspondents stationed in liberated France reacted to what they saw. Many were frankly amazed by how much the Paris that they remembered and loved from before the war had been completely transformed by the shortages and difficulties. So when you look at articles from the time, you can see how they searched for new ways to explain to readers back home just how tough the post-liberation existence was in Paris. They explained that although many shops had been forced to close due to food rationing and shortages, Strangely enough, many of Paris's most famous luxury boutiques continued creating window displays that were just as impressive and beautiful and clever as they remembered from before the war. But more often than not, these were Potemkin villages. They served as literal window dressings since there was not much actually for sale inside those famous addresses. The New York Times had many articles explaining the new tough post-war reality. There's a quote from an article in 1945 that tells Times readers that the entire city of Paris was filled with paradoxes, writing that, this is a city where flowers are plentiful, but soap is scarce. Theaters are packed, but cupboards are bare. While it's might be filled with banknotes, post-war inflation was out of control, but minds are filled with discouragement and fatigue. Even beyond the kind of style changes that Lynn notes that you'd spot on the Parisian streets, as you'd probably expect, the war, the occupation, 
and the shortages had severe consequences for the entire French fashion industry. Before the war, there were officially 70 Parisian fashion houses, and of course many, many smaller designers. Two million French citizens' employment depended on the country's fashion business. It was, after all, the second biggest export industry of the country. But during the war and the occupation, many designers had fled France or closed their business. Those businesses that did try to survive during the occupation were faced with extreme shortages of workers, fabrics, thread, parts, and machinery. The Nazi strategic plan for ruling Europe called for replacing Paris as the fashion capital and turning Berlin and Vienna into this 20th century's new centers of couture. So new head offices were established and subsidies given to German clothing manufacturers in those cities. At the same time, the Nazis forced Parisian houses to cut drastically back on production, forbidding advertising and exports, limiting each house to just 40 new styles each season, and forcing skilled artisans to move to Germany to work for Nazi firms and train a new generation of workers to replace them. You may remember from our first podcast that Pierre Beaumont's wartime employer, Lucien Lalonde, was determined to thwart the Nazi plan. And in the end, fighting against very great odds, he was actually successful, and he helped to preserve this key national industry. But although it had been saved, the fashion industry was far from healthy after the liberation. There was a new and strong competition coming from the Americans, where new designers and companies had grown very quickly during the war, due to the elimination of foreign competition and the massive growth of the American economy. And just like everyone else, the French fashion houses had shortages and rationing to deal with. So, to help the industry manage to survive despite all the shortages, the Chambre Syndicale de la Couture, which is the powerful trade organization that governs each and every element of French fashion, instituted a series of strict measures in March 1945. Every recognized fashion house was told it could only create 60 styles per season, and these regulations went even further. Within each collection, each individual creation could only rely on a specific amount of fabric. For example, a dress could only use three and a half yards or 2.7 meters of fabric. Coats were limited to four and a half yards or 3.7 meters. And short sleeve blouses to two and a half yards or 1.8 meters of fabric. So, limited to these small amounts of cloths, the designers were obligated to cut much closer to the body which actually could be difficult, since due to shortages of wool, of linen, and cotton, they were often forced to rely on new types of fabrics, including synthetics and new advances in rayons. These fabrics were sometimes much more difficult to work with, since they could easily be creased or wrinkled. Designers found themselves forced to think of new ways of cutting, of draping, and of fitting in order to work these fabrics into their collections. And, in addition, colors were not always what designers were hoping for either. Due to a lack of black or navy dyes, fabric houses were forced to experiment with brighter colors, a look that actually seemed to go well with the determination of Parisians to look forward to better days after years of suffering. To show the fashion industry's solidarity with its fellow citizens, prices were also strictly controlled. Although the truth is, with an average price for a couture dress between about $300 to $400, which we could translate roughly to about $4,000 to $6,000 in today's money, most Parisians really had little hope for buying couture. But couture and fashion were essential for France's post-war recovery, since exports were badly needed to help rebuild the economy. The reasons were simple. Government ministers estimated that one exported couture dress was worth 10 tons of badly needed coal. One liter of French perfume was worth two tons of gasoline. As Lucien Lalong explained, fashion needed to be a locomotive pulling a very long train. And even within France, in spite of the tough post-liberation economy, there were still those who were eager to spend their money on new styles. The post-war period was marked by a very high inflation, so those who did have money were often eager to spend it, since francs were losing a little bit of their value each day. And fashion was one of the few luxuries that people could actually still spend money on, 
The shortages, rationing, and government regulations meant that it was no longer easy to spend money on travel, second homes, cars, vacations, or extravagant meals at five-star restaurants. So fashion was one of the few choices remaining for those eager to spend money on some sort of escapism from a somewhat gloomy present. And of course, it was a type of French souvenir that many American and British diplomats, journalists, and military leaders were eager to bring home with them. So both the new French government and the Paris fashion houses were eager to promote their designers and the latest post-war collections. Everyone wanted this important industry to recover. But with the restrictions, the shortages, and the lack of tourists, any sort of lavish presentation was simply out of the question. You may have noticed that post-liberation Parisian fashion faced one of the same challenges that fashion has been forced to confront in 2020. It's a very basic sort of challenge. How to present a collection. Of course, our present situation during COVID, while difficult, is not as extreme as what Pierre Balmain and the other French designers had to face immediately after liberation. But 2020's pandemic shutdowns and travel bans did force fashion houses to quickly invent entirely new ways of getting their latest creations in front of followers, clients, and the press. And we've seen some very clever ideas this year. As designers and their teams dreamt up new takes on video games, TV series, and even puppets, many houses relied on videos, some of which were very cleverly done with impressive production values. Others simply pushed new spins on campaign photos, press mailings, and lookbooks. Olivier Ristong, though, insisted on live presentations, and he pushed his team and himself to work out new ways to get a runway presentation in front of his Balmain audience. First in July, just a few months after Paris came out of lockdown, Roustonk showed his models on a peniche. Peniche are the type of special flatbed boats that they use to transport goods up and down the Seine River here in France. Roustonk and his models floated atop a peniche through the very center of Paris during an incredibly beautiful bright summer day, showing the Balmain designs from a safe distance to those watching from the city's right or left banks or to those watching from above, leaning over the edges of Paris's many famous bridges. In September, Roustong and his Balmain team set up dozens of flat screens in the seating area in order to find a way to digitally include all of the house's friends and fashion partners who were blocked from traveling to Paris. Balmain's models walked in front of these virtual guests and under the stars, down a special runway that was set up inside Paris's historic Jardin des Plantes. And just a few weeks ago, Olivier Roustan shot the house's latest pre-fall styles from behind the front glass windows of Beaumont's boutique on the Rue saint Honoré. Those enormous plate glass windows served as a new sort of, I guess, transparent mask, providing the necessary social distancing for all the Parisian passerbys who stopped to watch. Roustan cleverly showed his collection live, building on Pierre Beaumont's unique tradition of shooting his designs on Paris sidewalks, but doing it in a safe way that respected today's new realities and today's new restrictions. So now, after learning in 2020 just how tough it can be to conceive of new ways to present fashion in an alternative manner, we maybe have a little bit of the insight on what Paris's fashion planners were facing as they thought through the challenges of promoting their collections in early 1945. Of course, it was a million times more difficult for them. They had no fabric, they had no money, they had no heat, no reliable electricity, and very few workers. And they knew that the international press and foreign clients were not going to be able to come to Paris so soon after the liberation. So they were forced to improvise. And I have to say, they came up with a pretty fantastic and very original solution. They dreamt up an entirely new and enchanting way to present the type of creations that only Paris fashion is capable of designing, as Lanier explains. Okay, may I just say on a personal note, as a doll enthusiast, I find this really moving and really adorable. So here's what happened. In early March 1945, a special exhibit was set up inside the Louvre. 60 Paris couturiers helped install what they called the Théâtre de la Mode. They relied on about 200 dolls, each about two feet tall. 
Each doll had been specially created from thick wires and plaster heads, and all of them set up in a series of 15 miniature stages that had been created by some of Paris's most talented designers, including Jean Cocteau and Christian Barraud. Each courtier created about five outfits, giving each house's dolls a selection of morning, afternoon cocktail and dinner looks. The mini outfits were amazing, perfectly scaled down versions of couture designs with working zippers, buttonholes, shoes, and jeweled brooches executed in exact scale. Every detail perfectly cut, pleated and draped, everything exactly fitted, just as you would expect from Paris's best couture tailoring. And just imagine how thrilling it was to see all of these jewels and buttonholes and all the things that you were deprived of and these amazing doll creations. The dolls were even given miniature hats created by Paris's best milliners, as well as wigs created from human hair, made by the most famous hairstylist in Paris, Antoine and Guillaume. The doll-sized tiaras, bracelets, and necklaces came only from the best names, including Cartier, Chaumet, and Van Cleef in our bells. So how do they end up displaying all those special little couture dolls that you seem to really <laughs> love a lot? Did they just set them up on some sort of little mini fashion runway? The 200 designs of the Theatre de la Mode were grouped by style. For the collection of daytime suits and dresses, the sets were inspired by many Parisian postcard scenes. The mannequins were post window shopping in the Place Vendôme and strolling outside the Palais Royal. Most locations looked to everyday life from pre-war times, including sunbathing at Deauville or a night at the opera. Admission was charged to raise money for the French war relief, and the Louvre exhibit attracted nearly 100,000 visitors. And you can just imagine what it was like, this exercise in nostalgia and longing, and this, the beauty of seeing this sort of carefree way that the dolls are window shopping and sunbathing, and what that must have meant to the French coming after so many years of deprivation. So the Parisians must, were flocking to see this incredible show at the Louvre, and of course, you can totally understand it. But I assume that very few buyers and hardly any members of the international fashion press were able to travel at that time to see this one-of-a-kind exhibit. I mean, this opened in, what, April 1945? Which means the war was still going on because Germany's defeat was still a month away, right? So if the war was still going on when this exhibit premiered, how were they going to get these dolls in front of the fashion professionals? I mean, after all, the houses must have been desperate to get their collections in front of the international buyers and fashion press, right? Well, here's the advantage of using dolls. They sent them. After they displayed the collection in Paris, the exhibit traveled to London, Stockholm, Copenhagen, and Barcelona for the rest of 1945. Then, once they finished their European tour, the dolls returned to Paris to be outfitted with new clothes that the houses had designed for the 1946 season. Oh, those lucky dolls. After that, the exhibition was sent across the Atlantic and the exhibit toward the U.S. So those doll dresses held some of the first Bauman's presented in the United States. There is one gray tulle Bauman dress set on a witch flying from the rafters of a bombed-out maid's room that got a lot of attention. The press talked about this doll as much for Bauman's design as for the crazy setting it was displayed in, since it was a realistic scene dripped up by the famous designer and filmmaker Jean Cocteau. But before he could even think of presenting his first collection on real models and in front of an actual audience, Pierre Beaumont had some pretty major obstacles to overcome. The empty real estate that he had stumbled across shortly after the Nazis had fled a newly liberated Paris was definitely in the perfect location. 44 Rue de Francois Premier is smack in the middle of the famous Triangle d'Or, which is the Golden Triangle, an incredible area of real estate bordered by three of the French capital's most aristocratic avenues. The Avenue Montaigne, which is known for its incredible luxury boutiques, the stately Avenue Georges Sank, which holds some of the city's most important luxury hotels, and of course the very famous Avenue de Champs-Élysées, which is known to the French as the plus belle Avenue du monde, the most beautiful avenue in the world. The building itself, like so many in the neighborhood, is a very handsome five-story Hausmannian structure. It follows all the rules of that quintessential Parisian architectural style. Before the war had been a beautiful residential building, well, up until the Nazis had requisitioned it during the occupation. After the liberation had forced the Nazis out, the landlord was determined to change all of his leases into commercial agreements which allowed Pierre Beaumont the rare opportunity of grabbing a showroom space in fashion's most coveted neighborhood. 
In his memoirs, Bauman admits he was a little bit amazed. Being just a young kid with no real key money to put down, little experience to note, and only his mother's shop and acts as a reference, he was actually someone who could actually get a place like that. He feared that he would inevitably be rejected, but he decided to come to the written negotiations with an attitude. And somehow it worked. He was actually able to convince them to give him the lease. But even though the address and the facade were very impressive, the new space wasn't exactly suited for the needs of a fashion designer. It was way too small of a space, and it was still laid out for an apartment living. Balmain was actually forced to convert the old bathroom into his design studio. He created a desk by laying a board across the bathtub. Fabrics were stored in new shelves that he had thrown up quickly in the kitchen. The long hallway was given over to a switchboard, desk, and racks and racks of clothing. And like almost every new young designer, Balmain had to deal with financial problems as he designed his collection. To save money, he moved into the space. He would work there during the day and sleep there at night as he worked on his first season's offerings. And then his initial backers actually changed their mind at the very last moment, forcing him to scramble and plead with bankers and search for new investors, which somehow he was able to do. But then probably the worst thing happened. When 200,000 French francs went missing from the office safe, he had no idea what to do. His mother actually ended up saving the day by prying the diamond off her engagement ring to pawn for needed funds. Balmain hired a team of 24 for his new house, including 16 newly hired workers who were set up in the converted drawing room space. But for them, he had only 15 stools, so whoever arrived last was forced to sit the day in the umbrella stand. He also did not have enough room in the apartment for his two tailors, who were forced to work off-site. And throughout this entire period, he was haunted by legal problems. Basically, there were problems with the lease that he had signed. The landlord had agreed to give him the space, even though it appears he really didn't have a right to do that. The new French government had passed a decree, making it clear that all properties that had been requisitioned by the Nazis during the war were to be handed over to de Gaulle's new government. France's new post-war government had plans for the space, they wanted it to be converted into the new economic ministry offices. So Baman received many threatening letters and visits from authorities threatening to evict him. And to deal with them, he devised a somewhat novel solution, which frankly few Parisians would even dare to try today. Whenever the authorities would knock on the door, he would force his mother to lie in bed, and then he would claim to them that she was too ill to move. And somehow, Amazingly enough, that ruse actually seemed to have worked. And then on the very day of his first show, after he had been up all night doing the typical frantic last-minute additions and changes, the French authorities showed up twice to tell him that he had to leave. So of course, maybe we can understand his reaction, taking into account all the pressures of that day of a show. But he writes in his memoirs that he completely lost it. He started screaming at them and actually pushed them out the door. Okay, so believe me when I say this, people in Paris know that it doesn't really help a lot to scream at governmental authorities, much less physically push them away. So Pierre Malam must have had a very patient person at his door that day, luckily one who decided to just walk away. And of course, just like everyone else, Pierre Beaumont was also dealing with the challenges of rationing and shortages in post-war France. This was a time of no heat and constant electricity shortages. Working conditions were far from ideal. One of Pierre Beaumont's first commissions was for a very wealthy Brazilian-French socialite named Francine Westweiler. She's best known for her support for avant-garde Parisian artists like Jean Cocteau. Westweiler had just returned to Paris from America where she had gone to escape the Nazis. She commissioned five gowns from Beaumont, and that was a very big deal for a new house. So he pushed his team to work night and day on them. But because of the unreliable electricity, he was forced to rely on carbide lamps to provide light. The lamp's flames actually ignited one of the dresses. So he missed the deadline and couldn't provide the promised dresses. This seemed to have greatly upset Madame Westfather, causing Beaumont to lose her support and this great opportunity. On the other hand, there's one very sweet story from this period as well. Pierre Beaumont, as a new designer, 
knew that he would never be able to compete for press attention if he showed at the same time as a more famous and established house. So he chose his date, October 12, 1945, very carefully, constantly checking to make sure that no Parisian houses would be showing at the same time as he planned before he sent out all his invitations. And then, of course, it happened. Every young designer's worst nightmare. Somebody rescheduled. In this case, it wasn't just anybody. It was the legendary Madame Grey, who changed her date of her show with a new date conflicting directly with Balmain's. So the young Pierre Balmain, who was still an unknown to most, decided to just call up the fashion legend directly, which must have taken a lot of nerve, and beg her to change her date. She actually took his call. She listened to him, and she agreed to change the date of her show for his sake. It's actually really nice to know that her understanding and generosity toward Paris's newest young designer helped to ensure the successful press reaction to Pierre Beaumont's very first show. In his memoirs, Pierre Beaumont writes about everyone working nonstop in the days leading up to the show. And it was kind of a family affair. His aunt came to Paris from Savoy to join his mother in helping out, and even Pierre Beaumont spent many late nights sewing his own collection's designs. Beaumont team members sleep on the carpet using rolls of fabric for pillows, and Beaumont talks about people actually fainting from exhaustion, and how he was just basically surviving on coffee. This all might have happened 75 years ago, but Pierre Beaumont's anxiety, money problems, scheduling nightmares, and crazy schedule is pretty much the same story that almost every young designer today can recognize and relate to. And finally, the day arrived for the first collection. So then it's clear that Pierre Beaumont was facing many difficulties as he designed his first collection. Could you tell us how those regulations, difficulties, and shortages affected his first collection? Well, of course, like other designers in the newly liberated Paris, Pierre Balmain was forced to work within the very tough restrictions and rationing of the time. He was only permitted to show a limited number of designs and had to respect the strict limitations that set out the maximum amount of fabric that could be used for each dress, coat, and shirt that he showed that day. But he clearly didn't intend to let those rules cut back on his creativity. Even within those limits, he managed to propose some very big changes. Pierre Balmain managed to show that designers could respond to the post-war necessities and limits while still inspiring with new ideas and young at heart designs. So Lynn, when we started this call, you were describing the unique and incredibly interesting Parisian street style that one would have seen during the war and right after the liberation. So how would you place Pierre Balmain's first collection in relation to that unique fashion context? Balmain was not interested in reproducing the styles that echoed the hardships of the war. He said no to the clunky platform shoes, no to the padded shoulders, no to the short skirts, no to the straight and square silhouette that were dominant on the streets of wartime Paris. In so many ways, the first Balmain collection was part of the beginning of a new post-war aesthetic in every other part of French culture. Like many of his fellow Parisians, Balmain seemed eager to move as far away and as quickly as possible from anything that recalled the mindset of the occupation. Instead, he put forward a new, softer, more elongated, and more feminine spirit. Okay, so of course, this is not an easy thing to do on a podcast. But Lynn, how would you describe this first Balmain collection? What were, the de- what were the designs really like? I think this first collection can be summed up with two words, luxury and simplicity. Two words that sometimes don't go together in the contemporary mindset, but should. And let me explain. That's very long and slender spirit is something that's easy to notice as you go through the sketches for this collection. Even the pleated skirts manage to remain very slender. It's about softness and femininity. Shoulders are natural, waists are cinched, and there's a lot of skillful draping. But it wasn't just the long slender lines. To provide a bit of contrast to the collection's slim pants and sheaths, he threw in some fuller coats, and for evening, there were some full skirted styles. And... You know, the whole idea of evening is so fabulous when you've been occupied for so many years, as well as a lot of elegant slim sheaths. There were also some touches that surprised the press and guaranteed Bauman some extra lines in the reviews of the collections. First, he included a beautiful variation of the typical pullover from the Brittany region in France, a verreuse. 
he managed to give a youthful and luxurious spin to that age-old design, one that's best known for the Atlantic Coast fishermen who wear it. It was clearly an unexpected look. It formed part of that presentation's first ensemble, and it looks so young and chic, especially if you put it with slim pants and flat suede shoes, not shoes made out of uh, cork, not shoes that went clackety-clack. So it's easy to understand why it ended up being a favorite image to accompany the stories in the fashion press. There was also a strong Asian influence in many designs. Bauman was inspired by the traditional Vietnamese short jackets, giving his interpretation some impressive embroideries. There were also some beautiful takes on kimonos crafted with cleverly hidden zippers. So Lynn, as you look over the pictures and images of this collection, is there anything that pops out at you from this collection as being particularly a Bauman collection, a Bauman design? By that I mean, do, do you spot any designs, any spirit, any look that help make this collection clearly a Bauman collection? Actually, there's a lot. The emphasis on a woman's natural shape when creating the silhouette, and even the love of making a traditional French garment into a luxury item. Olivier is known for his luxury treatments of the traditional Marinier sweater, and Pierre Balmain's luxury rethinking of the Breton Verreuse can be seen as setting that tradition. One thing in particular sets apart these first designs, and I guess you could say help to begin to establish the house's signature. There's the same love of embellishment that we can still see today in Olivier Roustang's designs. Pierre Balmain's skillful embroidery on his cocktail evening and even daytime offerings was noted by the critics. That added artisanal touch was a smart move from Pierre Balmain. It was his way of underlining his luxury positioning. It was a clever way of creating true couture luxury in spite of the post-war restrictions on fabric use per collections. Speaking of fabric shortages, there's one background story that stands out for this collection and gives you an idea of the climate of the times. As you'd expect with all the shortages, Balmain did have difficulties getting all the fabrics he needed for his show. To help him, his mother actually donated his favorite coat, which was cut up to be used for the different outfits and possibly even the chic small hats that several of the models wore. And may I just add, I'm glad that I was not his mother. So Pierre Beaumont appears to have first shown this premier collection to the press and good friends in September, and then he had his official collection shown in October. When it was all over, as every designer has to do, all he could do was sit and wait for the reviews. And frankly, they were pretty amazing. The collection itself was more than well received, with magazines like La Poque calling it very smart and seductive, Les Lettres Francaises praised the collection's fireworks of new ideas, Point de Vue praised the elegance, sobriety, and pretty details, and Femina mentioning that ever since the day of the show, everyone in Paris kept asking each other, have you seen Balmain? Minerva simply showed one of the hats from the collection with a photo caption reading, hats off to Balmain's great elegance, strict tailoring, and refined embroidery. And critics were also ready to praise the collection's designer, Pierre Valmont, with Action Magazine labeling him as the newest star in fashion's constellation, Laute Mode calling Balmain a magnificent artist who was breaking traditions, and Gavroche declaring that this very Parisian collection meant that Pierre Balmain could be now considered as among the top level of designers. This was a view that was echoed by the New York Herald Tribune, which stated that the successful new collection allowed the new house of Pierre Beaumont to be considered on the same level as that moment's other great houses of Paris, including Balenciaga, Le Long, Molyneux, and Patou. But the impact of the first collection was to go much, much farther than just the press's reactions to the 50 or so outfits that they had been shown. In our next podcast, we'll explore some fantastic stories and compelling fashion personalities connected to the first Balmain collection. And we'll see how that first collection success helped to quickly gain Pierre Balmain the friendships, the connections, and the commissions he needed to begin building his house into one of the great couture houses of Paris. Ba-da-da-da, <laughs> <laughs>